Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Prakash Madhapathy, who's going to talk today about always-on DSPs. Prakash, where are you seeing DSPs being used today, and what's changing in terms of some of these things always have to be on because they're always listening? What's the problem? So you're right. The um, DSPs actually nowadays are becoming more and more prevalent uh, in different aspects of our lives. Different devices want to incorporate DSPs for different always-on functions. And what that means is that these devices want to be powered on all the time and provide a service to users you know, at uh, any given moment in time without the users having to push a button or, or be able to uh, interact in other ways. So being able to uh, talk to a device purely with voice gives a kind of convenience to users that uh, they really appreciate. A lot of devices nowadays are already incorporating uh, uh, always listening modes. So for example, voice commands are prevalent on various home devices, app appliances like um, uh, microwave ovens and washers and dryers and so on. A lot of those are tied in with a plug though, right? I mean, these are wired right into the wall. The bigger challenge becomes when you start doing this with thing, devices with a battery. Absolutely, you're right. So, um, you know, even the wall power devices do need to save energy. And that's a key aspect of going green in today's world. Because once you have not one device, but a billion devices that are always on, that's a power consumption problem all in itself. So uh, it is necessary and important for the future to maintain low power, even in those cases. So let's dig into this. Yes, yeah, sure. Prakash, what are we looking at here? Okay, so as you mentioned that um, uh, the battery life is very important uh, in smaller battery devices. Uh, let's look at uh, the block diagram of an always on uh, DSP inside of a true wireless stereo earbud. And this can also apply to uh, headsets and smart watches and, and so on as well. This DSP is in an ultra low energy domain. So it's basically consuming very low power. And let's assume that uh, it's been running an overnight sitting on the nightstand, so you're not really using it. Well, it's looking at the sensor inputs coming in from a, a sensor plex of, uh, of uh, inputs. Uh, these could be touch sensors, motion sensors, even buttons for, for that matter. And all of these devices are giving it inputs uh, continuously uh, for hours and hours and hours. And it's looking at the data to see if there's something that the DSP uh, can figure out uh, as to you know, what the user wants it to do. So especially at night when there is no activity, uh, it'll say that uh, the user does not want an input. So it'll just uh, stay on and uh, keep the system in power down mode. Now, the moment the uh, user utters some, uh, the keyword that wants to wake up the system and maybe play some music through it or you know, enter into a phone call, that's when the Hi-Fi DSP will uh, sense that and then send a wake up command to the Bluetooth radio and the Bluetooth uh, controller in the baseband wake up the system, and then start streaming the audio uh, application in this case. So as you can see here, um, the rest of the system is basically in a power down mode. And that's how the DSP maintains uh, long battery life by keeping uh, everything in, in a power down mode, while it is the only one that is running and looking for uh, inputs, performing sensor fusion continuously, and seeing if the user in this case needs some input or there's some change in the environment, uh, that means that it must, must take some action to uh, react to that. In the past, one of the strategies for saving energy was to put everything into dark silicon, basically turn everything way down and wake it all up. What we've done here is gotten more granular about this, right? So some of the very, very low power elements stay on all the time. Other ones can wake up. Is there a penalty though for turning things off and turning them on too often? Uh, it depends on how often you do it. If you do it, uh, say, once a second or once every other second, it shouldn't be a big penalty because then there is some startup time for the uh, Bluetooth uh, radio and, and the, uh, the Bluetooth uh, controller to wake up and then pair with the, uh, with the smartphone or the, uh, uh, or the laptop, uh, as the case may be. Typically, in terms of uh, human time, let's say it could take a you know, few hundred milliseconds. It is not... Uh, that big a deal and the users can generally wait uh, you know to do that so how far down can you actually ratchet the power here it is doing sensor fusion you know let's say at just a few megahertz 
and uh, because the sensor inputs are not very high frequency. And once it figures out that uh, the sensor has required some input, uh, that uh, you know the user wants uh, to uh, do some perform some action, at that time it can raise its frequency to whatever level is required to run the application the user wants. If you have two DSPs in there and they're both always on, do they communicate with each other? Is there one that is it better to have two than put all, everything into one chip? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question out here. So first of all, uh, the two are not both always on. So the uh, one in the green box here is the always on DSP and it continues to do the same functions as we mentioned in the previous uh, uh, configuration where there was only one DSP. Now, the, the DSP in the blue is kept in power down mode just as, it, as with the other uh, components in the system. It's only when the application requires more processing than the always on DSP can handle. That is when the HiFi one DSP in the always on wakes up the other DSP and offloads that application to that DSP to run. What does this kind of approach do in terms of battery life? How much can you actually gain by using this? Battery life depends upon how often the device is up and how long it is running each time, uh, which is um, you know, use case dependent. Uh, you also find that uh, the high performance domain only gets activated uh, under uh, rather extreme conditions because the HiFi One is able to handle a lot of the workloads all by itself. So it doesn't turn on the uh, always on domain uh, that often. Now that said, um, uh, here's another approach uh, to, uh, to battery life as well. So nowadays, uh, a lot of the applications are going the AI uh, route in terms of uh, uh, the kind of algorithms uh, that are pervading the, uh, the audio and voice space. So uh, here we show uh, the always on DSP connected to a uh, neural network accelerator. In this case, it happens to be the uh, NNE 110 uh, from Cadence, but this could be uh, you know, any such configuration. So uh, all, both these devices, if they are low power, uh, it can provide uh, uh, for you know, performance at uh, ultra low energy levels. So in this case, the neural network accelerator is a, a block of a hardware that meets with the DSP. And because it's a piece of hardware that is uh, purpose built for neural network acceleration, uh, it consumes a, a lot less power than a, a, a DSP would. And you're dealing with one of the big issues here, which is that the processors that we used to know or the SOCs are really being disaggregated into lots of different components right now. We used to have a main processor and then we'd have memory and we'd have a few other elements, DSPs floating around possibly on the processor. Now these things are potentially sitting in a package or even on an SOC, but it's more of them and they're more flexible and fluid in terms of what's being used, right? That is correct. So uh, earlier we used to have uh, in previous systems, uh, many different components that would have to communicate with each other and that would introduce complexity in terms of uh, how to bring the system up and make it reliable. Now, in this case, uh, the DSPs themselves are becoming more capable. So they can actually subsume a lot of the functionality of other devices. So for example, uh, a DSP that can also do good with control functions could even subsume the functionality of the Bluetooth controller. And we have received requests from, from uh, different uh, uh, partners as well as uh, OEMs that say, can we run the uh, dual mode Bluetooth uh, control functions on the Hi-Fi DSP as well? And the answer is yes. So if you do that and, and uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, integrate those functionality into one uh, very capable DSP that runs at ultra low energy levels, you essentially have um, a system that has a fewer components and therefore uh, the number of tools that you have to uh, uh, to access uh, the uh, the processing on this uh, on your device uh, are fewer, and therefore the, the number of environments that you have to work with become low, smaller as well, making it uh, much easier to to develop a whole system. If you're a, a design team and you're working with different chips here, there are many ways now to get to the same place. How do you sort through? What's the best option? Is it just price? Is it what you know and you've worked with? Is A lot of these are brand new, so they don't have experience with some of these chips. So in order to create a DSP like this, one actually has to um, uh, look at the target applications first. 
and try to um, profile those target applications to see what in those target applications requires um, optimization. So we have done uh, a lot of that by analyzing a lot of the uh, codecs uh, that are prevalent uh, in the in the modern uh, application suite, as well as a lot of the uh, uh, the neural network kind of workloads that uh, we are seeing in percolate down from the video world to the audio and voice uh, 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 arena. Because as you know, the uh, neural network kind of applications uh, sort of started with the vision as one of their first um, uh, you know, targets. And only now we are seeing uh, some of those actually, uh, uh, you know, percolate down to the uh, audio and voice world. So now there are uh, NN applications and, uh, and networks that are more uh, tuned for audio and voice. And we made sure that we analyze those to find out uh, what uh, works well. So for example, uh, there is the OK Google workload um, uh, that is a benchmark for uh, wake on and voice kind of applications. And it is based on neural networks and uh, Google pushed that out for uh, as a benchmark. So when we run that, we, we figured out how we can optimize this Hi-Fi 1 DSP for that kind of workload and we put in the right smarts. Not too much, because if you put too much in there, it no longer remains a compact DSP, it becomes a big DSP. And that has other implications in terms of uh, leakage, which can also uh, affect your battery life. So by analyzing those kind of workloads, we're able to uh, create a DSP that is very well targeted for those applications. So, so one of the challenges here is that you have to get enough precision into this so, and accuracy so that you can recognize what people are saying, depending upon accents, depending upon how fast they talk, things like that, ambient noise. But you also have to be able to save power too. And that's the big trade-off here, right? And, and that is exactly right. So. Uh, there is no uh, uh, free lunch here. So if we add too much uh, in terms of uh, instructions and architectural features to handle uh, heavy neural network workloads, for example, then this cannot be an always on DSP anymore because it is not consuming too much uh, power just even when it's idling because uh, the leakage in this case uh, then starts to become significant. So the name of the game here is to maintain uh, the, uh, the area, the PPA, uh, to be the appropriate uh, balance. Really what you're getting to here is you don't want a, a DSP that can do everything. You want just one function which says, wake everything up if it has to. And that's just a solid communication between one chip and another, right? That is correct. So it is a well-defined uh, task where we know that in the always-on domain, there are only a set number of functions that uh, the DSP has to run. And with that envelope of uh, requirements, one can uh, clearly define what the DSP can do and does and, and create a very efficient architecture for that. Beyond that, um, when there is more requirements, there is the um, more higher performance DSPs that one can offload to. And that communication can be very easily accomplished through shared memory structures between the DSPs so that um, uh, the other DSP acts as a slave to the commands coming from the always-on DSP that also acts as the main controller. Prakash, Marwat, Papi, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.